history of money making in Madras is my topic. And uh, I just wanted to tell you that uh, we have never been new to making money. We were always making money, we are making money and we will continue to make money in the years that come. There is a very strong theory that Bombay is the financial capital of India. But in my opinion, Chennai is not very much second. It is there and it's pretty close up there. Let's see what we have by way of history. So this is a carving that you will see on top of the Gopuram in the Kapalishwara temple. And that is Jnana Samandar being welcomed by Sivanesan Chetiar and his wife and their daughter Pumpave after Samandar has resurrected Pumpave from the ashes. And so it indicates that even in the 7th century, this area, Mailapur and other places, you had a number of Chetiars who were doing business. And Chetiar, the very word, it indicates where they come from. All across the country, you have the same community. So you've got the Sets, you've got the Setias, you've got the Chettis, you've got the Chetiars, the Shreshtins, the Shroffs. All of them come from the same root word, which is Shreshtin in Sanskrit, which means they were the people who were the best in the community, to whom your wealth could be given and they would take care of it. Essentially, they were into the business of multiplying wealth. And why were they called Shreshtins? Because during the time of peace, that is when they operated. During the time of war, business is never very good. But when there is peace and prosperity, money could be entrusted to the Chetiyars and or their equivalents all across India. And they would take care of it. They would take care that it generates interest. So I would qualify them to be the first financial, independent financial advisors, so to speak, in this country. And they grew along with the country. So as long as there were rulers, the Cholas, and later the Nayaks, the Vijayanagar rulers, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, the English, everybody operated on Chetiar backing. The East India Company had several times when it did not have cash, Chetiar, giving the money, loaning the money on interest, and then the money being repaid. When the East India Company wanted to go to Burma, wanted to go to Malaysia, who do you think went along with them? The Chetiyars. They funded the expansion. They funded the acquisition of the estates, the rubber plantations, the oil drilling, everything that went on in the Far East was taken care of by Chetiyar money. So they were actually the people who kept the empire growing for a very long time. Valluvar, we believe that he was born in Mailapur. If that is true, we don't know for sure. But then if he was born in Mailapur, and if he was a Jain, as it is very commonly believed, the Jains were also in the forefront of making money. They believed that it was their dharma to make profit. And just like the Chetiyas, their belief was also that a part of the wealth had to be spent on charity. And their definition of charity was education and health. Even today, it remains the same. This fundamental definition hasn't changed in any way. Most of the early schools in Tamil were started by the Jains, which is why the term for a school is even today Palli. And what is a Palli? Palli was where the monks in the Jain community would go and lie down and rest when they were dying. And that is when they would pass on their education to people. And that is how the school, term for school even today is Palli. And so we have one more connect with wealth. Now the British came here in 1639. So we were, we existed long before the British, let's not forget that. There's a popular theory that Chennai came into existence with the British. I strongly disagree with that. Much of what we see, including where we are today, Mamallapuram, these were all prosperous little settlements with lot of money being made, lots of businesses happening. The English came in 1639 and then they gave this place a new meaning. We became the colonial city of Madras. And in this colonial city of Madras, why did they come here? They did not come for anything other than profit making. And what were they going to make profits out of? Selling cloth. Even today, cloth is something that Chennai is very famous for. In 2015, during the floods, where were people? They were still inside RMKV and Nalli and Pothis. During the Vardha cyclone, people were still shopping. So this cloth business is something that we have a very long history with in Chennai city. And the English came here not because of the shops, but because we were centers of excellence of weaving. And among the centers of excellence of weaving was Mambalam, 
which was known for its kalamkari and for its printing. Painting and printing is what the East India Company talks about. Basically, it is kalamkari and block printing. And these were all the villages where this cloth was being woven. They were buying it and then they were taking it abroad. It was being sold in the Far East. It was being sold in Europe. It was making a lot of money for the English East India Company. They knew they did not know the local language. And they needed Indians to support them. So just behind Fort St. George, you had what was Georgetown or Black Town, Karuparhel Patanam, which is where Indians lived and they provided the backbone for the trade that the East India Company was doing. You needed people to go and meet the weavers, give them money, tell them what specification of cloth was required. Then when the cloth is woven, bring it back, show it to the East India Company, demonstrate that it is of a certain quality. All this had to be done by a certain deadline. If we software programming, we keep talking about scrum masters, we keep talking about deliverables, everything was done by these people. The ship will come and the ship cannot be kept waiting. The cloth has to be loaded and taken away. By the time, the quality has to be of a certain standard and it had to be graded based on quality. Everything had to be shipped out in time, otherwise all the money is going waste. And so, this is what they were doing and they began to learn. The English were not learning the Indian language, the Indians were learning the foreign language. So, they were acting as translators between two languages. Either they were speaking in Portuguese and Tamil or Telugu, or they were speaking in English or French and locally in Tamil or Telugu. And we had a new kind of multimillionaire in our midst, a person known as the Dubash, Dvi Bhashi, Muri Payar Pala. In two languages, this person will be able to speak between the true trading partners, the English East India Company or the French East India Company and the local weaver. And you can imagine how lucky this fellow was because neither party knew the language of the other party. Only he knew what was being spoken. All the money was going there. Because, you know, he would say, Dore is asking what is the price. This fellow will say 5 rupees for a yard. He'll tell Dore he's asking for 50 rupees for a yard. Dore will say, no, no, make it 45. He'll turn around and tell the guy, 2 rupees 50 paisa. If not, Dore is going elsewhere. So the weaver will give it. The difference in the transaction will go into the pockets of the Dubash or the Dvibhashi. Once again, independent financial advisory. <laughs> and this, today when you go to old Chennai, see today you will not find it here, but you go to Georgetown, you go to Triplicane, you go to Mailapur, most of the streets are named after these people. They were so rich. Lingi Chetti, Zambu Chetti, Erebalu Chetti, Naini Apanayakan, Sembudas, you name it. Natu Subrai Mudali, Lala, Hanumanta Lala, Every one of them after whom streets are named, these were all translators for the British East India Company and they were making money. So, these were the first wave of millionaires who came immediately after. Now, corruption is also a way of making money. You become rich overnight. And this corruption is not something that we were new to. We knew we were, we were fairly corrupt. We are still fairly corrupt. We will continue to be fairly corrupt. Let us not disguise ourselves. But the English fine-tuned that whole thing, you know, they showed us better ways, more refined systems of making money. Elihu Yale, who came here in the 1680s, became governor of Madras and operated exactly like the modern politician. Everything that passed through Chennai city had to have a commission given to Mr. Yale. And Yale operated through, not through a network of trusted aides, a network of trusted women. And so, the women who were in the business were the first women entrepreneurs of Madras. They published their own letterheads. They were all commission agents for Elihu Yale. Yale made so much of money that a commission of inquiry was sent from England to investigate. You know what happens, right? Everybody was bribed and they wrote a letter saying he is the most honest man we have ever come across. He is an angel. Then Yale went back to England, happily retired. Then from America, somebody sent him a letter saying that, you know, we are starting a new college in America. We want some money from you. He sent them some goods, some paintings, books and rugs that he had stolen from here. They auctioned it and they called that Yale University. So, we funded Yale University. The man who funded it made his money here. So, this is how our money goes. By 1799, the British had become very, very independent. They had no... 
a threat in the distance and many of them became merchants. So they were trading in goods. What were they doing? They were basically taking raw material from here, sending it out to England, bringing back finished goods from there and selling it over here. So arbitrage in a very big way, leveraging the difference between the price of the raw material and the price of the finished good, ensuring that nothing was ever produced in India. No finished good could be produced here. Only raw material could be produced here because that is how the profit could be made, right? If we started making the same cloth, if we started making the same, uh, uh, you know, water closet or tap or enamelware or lantern or anything, then the money will not be the same. So all the raw material would go from here, it would get manufactured in England and then everything would be shipped back and we would pay money for it and they would be making the money. And this is the building, today it's called the Fort Museum in Fort St. George. This is where the first commodity exchange was set up. So all the merchants would meet here every day in the afternoon. Opposite that is the sea, the Bay of Bengal. If you stand here and look through the window, even today you can see the Bay of Bengal. Ships will come in that direction. From here they will know by way of signals as to what commodity is arriving and the price of the commodity will fluctuate in the first floor of this particular exchange. Downstairs there would be a bar because you needed to keep shoring up your spirits because sometimes you know the ship will sink and all your commodities will go so you needed to be kept Financial advisory is not very easy, I must say. It's a high-stress profession. And there was coffee and there was also a bank in the ground floor. The first modern bank of India, the Madras Bank. It started in this particular location. Today it's called the Fort Museum. So this is where much of British money history was actually written. Money out of real estate. Now what is this particular road? This is Broadway in, Chen in, in town. What, was it, what is it called today? It's called Prakasam Saleh. Now, why was it called Broadway? Because originally there was a gutter that flowed down this particular road. It separated town into two halves, Mutyal Peta and Pedanayakan Peta. And nobody believed that this Shakadai can be real estate. But it requires, you can see money in everything, right? So there was a man called Stephen Popham. He was uh, working for the East India Company here. He bought this entire gutter. Everybody laughed at him. And they said, you know, what the hell are you doing? You're buying a gutter. He then made a petition to the government and said, this gutter is a public nuisance. It is smelling, it is causing disease. Close the gutter. So the government said, okay, we will close the gutter. But where do you find the soil for closing the gutter? There was a hill where the central station is today. That was called Nari Maid. It was a slightly elevated area. He said, that is a security risk. You can make money by citing security risk at any point of time. Remember that people are always afraid, insecurity. So he said there is a hill there, when the French come to invade, they will mount the cannon on the hill and they will bombard Fort St. George. So what do you do? You flatten the hill. Now when you flatten the hill, where do you take the sand? Fill my gutter. So they brought the sand and filled the gutter. And because they filled it with sand, that area became Mannadi, which is what we know of it today. Manna Adichi, Dim support Adi 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 Adichi, flatten it. And then he called it Broadway. Overnight, the gutter became prime real estate. Nobody had seen such a broad road in this city. Everybody wanted to buy a house over here. He minted money and became a millionaire. He is buried in the St. Mary's Church in the uh, cemetery of St. Mary's on the island, just opposite Central Station. Someday you should go there and see him. He was one of the pioneers in real estate. Ippo sir, land. Three BHK with swimming pool, soon you will be getting. Then you pay the money, believing it. After 20 years, there is no sign of the building. This is exactly what Stephen Popham was doing. Now, Americans were, you know, one thing about Indians, you know, we have many success stories in our midst, but we always worship Americans. Bill Gates, what a great man. Steve Jobs, what a great man. But you know, anything Indian, that's okay, sir, but look at them, they are great, dynamic. So, Americans were the people who can make money where nothing exists. So, this is a prime example of what happened, was India is a very hot country, Chennai has got only three seasons, hot, hotter and hottest. Somewhere in America, there was a 13-year-old boy called Frederick Tudor in the 1700s. He, in a winter morning, got up and found everything was frozen around his house. He hit upon the idea and said, if so much of ice is over here, and in India they don't have anything called refrigeration, 
why don't we ship the ice from America to India? He was only 13 years old at that time. And then he begins to harvest the ice in the ponds around his area, which is in New Hampshire in Connecticut. Now, the first experimental measure, he's grown up by then, he's around 17, 18. First experimental measure is to ship the ice to the West Indies. By the time it reaches there, everything has melted. So, this is, there is no way that it's going to reach India. So, he hits upon the idea that if you pack it with salt and pine dust, that is wood dust, wood shavings, because that area is also known for wood cutting, Labrador area. So, you have lot of wood dust. So, you pack the wood, ice in wood, 70% will survive till it reaches the West Indies, 50% will survive by the time it reaches Madras. So, by the early 1800s, ice was being exported from America to Madras city. Madras, Calcutta and Bombay, all three were receiving ice from the United States of America. They were not only receiving ice, they were also receiving apples from there. You needed a place to store the ice. That is when this building was built. We call it Vivekananda Illam. This was where ice was stored. Even today, if you go there, you go to the basement of this building, you will find that there is a huge chamber where the ice used to be stored. Ice was being sent all the way from the United States. He became a multimillionaire because we had bad weather. So, you know, he realized that opportunity and he was making a profit on it. This is Paris Corner. Today, this building is new building. You can see it in 1938, the present building was built. This is where Paris building was and now the new building is. Paris is today the second oldest registered company of India, started in 1788 and it has been in this location from the 1790s onwards. And this is one example of a company that kept changing with time, making money continuously and continues to survive even today. So you name the business Parry was not in, you will not be able to find it. He was into lending money, he was into making porcelain, he was into making leather, into fertilizers, into liquor, everything. And even today, the company survives as a classic example of how a good organization has adapted itself to various trends and challenges that, you know, the financial world and the economic world keeps posing at it and manages and continues for a long period of time. Now, in the early 1820s, you had what was called the Supreme Court of Madras. Then by the 1860s, you had what was called the High Court of Madras. The High Court provided lot of employment because we are fundamentally litigious people. For everything, we'll go to court. Arbitration concept is not a court lesson. So, you know, the point is the moment you enter the court, what happens? A case will go on for at least 75 years. Vadi, Pradivadi, judge, everybody will be dead by the time the judgment comes. And so, everybody made money. The legal fraternity, the Mailapur Vakil, they became multi-millionaires between the 1860s and the 1950s. Hundred years was the heyday of the Mailapur Vakil. They would, by the 1920s, they were having money in six figures. You know, per month, some of them were earning as much as one lakh, one and a half lakhs and all that, just on litigation between Zamindari families. The estate of the Raja of Ramnad versus Singambati Nachiar the estate of the Raja of Sevaganga versus Tulkana Tamal and uh, uh, what is that? Nagaratnamma Devadasi. So, this kind of court cases used to go on for 75 years without any solution, but lawyers were always making money. So, Madras became the place where lawyers could mint a lot of money and this heyday went on for a good hundred years. Before a lot of competition came, now too many lawyers. So, you know, the money is very evenly distributed among several people. You must also remember that just close to this place, there is a building called Pachepas Hall. That Pachepas Hall is where today, by the way, the finance minister is presenting her budget speech even now. You must remember that in 1860, 1859-60 was when the first budget was presented and income tax was proposed for the first time. Guess which was the only city in India which protested the imposition of income tax? Chennai. Nobody else protested. Imagine protesting against income tax. What a noble thought. The public, the businessmen and the governor of Madras 
all participated in a protest against the imposition of income tax in 1859-60. Now, the governor was sacked. You know how it is, right? If you oppose the government policies, you are out of a job. Either the enforcement directorate will come or the governor will be removed. So, in this case, the governor was sacked and he went back to England. The finance minister who presented the budget died. And they could not get hold of anybody else who could implement the income tax. You know who implemented it? The governor who was sacked was brought back as finance member, government of India, and he implemented the income tax all over the country. Sir Charles Trevelyan. So the protest against tax happened in the shadow of this high court that you see. Real estate, again we go back. At that time it was land, now it became building. By the 1860s, the British were building buildings right across the city. So you had the university buildings coming up, the college buildings coming up, the high court coming up, metropolitan magistrates courts, the hospitals, and there was one man who minted money on it, Tartikonda Nambirumal Chetty, who was the contractor king of Madras. Every building that was red in color at one time was believed to have been built by Nambirumal Chetty. Nambirumal Chetty owned practically the whole of Chetpet area because he made so much of money. There was a rumor that Chetpet is actually named after Chetty Pete because he was Nambirumal Chetty. It was said that in Chennai, there were 99 houses owned by him. He didn't own a hundredth house because he said he didn't want to have bad luck brought on him. And the, the first Indian to own a car in this city was Nambir Malchetti. His registration number was MC02 or some such thing. So there is excellence, you know, so they, somebody identifies an opportunity and makes money out of it. So there was this man, he emphasized on excellence. The buildings that he constructed are standing even today. After 150 years, they are still, so that is testimony for the fact that the wealth that he earned was fully deserved. He was not mixing sand and water and putting up a structure which would demolish after two days. They are still standing. It just goes to show how much there was emphasis on excellence and the money that he made was completely deserving for that particular person. Cars. Today, we are, how many cars do we make? Chennai makes three cars every minute and one heavy vehicle every one and a half minutes. That is Chennai's production record today. We make more cars than Detroit in the United States of America. But still we call ourselves the Detroit of India. That is our humility. We don't say Detroit should call itself the Chennai of the United States of America. We don't do that. So the car business begins in the, 18, in the early 1900s when car chassis are imported from Europe and then we begin building bodies on top of it. So that, the companies that started it were Simpson and Addison. These were the two companies which are still part of the amalgamations group. And that is how they started making their money. Cars become a very big fad. And by the 1920s, many, many Indians have also got into the car trading business. And today, they are all still in business. You think of amalgamations, still in some way associated with automotive component manufacturing. TVS, still associated with auto component manufacturing. Rane, still. UCAL, they all started between the 1920s and the 1940s in trading in cars. They were importing cars from Europe and from the United States of America. They were selling it here. They saw the opportunity. And later, when manufacturing began in India, they all got into manufacturing, which is how they continue. Now, Indians were very afraid of manufacturing. Remember, I told you that the British were not at all interested that Indians should get into industry. We were only supposed to be traders. At that time, the government of Madras started what was called the Department of Industries in 1911. And it got the principal of the Gindi Engineering College, his name was Alfred Chatterton, to try and get Indians to do some manufacturing. Chatterton found that Indians were so reluctant, nothing was going to work. He got them to make aluminium vessels. Nobody would started. Then he said, let's start in a very simple way. Let's start making pencils and plastic buttons. And if Indians are not going to start production, let the government start the factory first. So let us run it for a few years, make a success out of it, and then we will auction it off to the first bidder whom we get. So Chatterton started what was called the Madras Pencil Factory in 1911. The wood came from Africa. The lead came from local mines and the pencils were made. He ran it for five years. 
and then he auctioned it to V. Perumal Chetty and Sons. How many of you have written with Perumal Chetty pencils? Our, our particular generation, I can see it. So we were all, we all grew up on the pencils of Perumal Chetty. That was the first manufacturing facility run by an Indian all across the country. It started here. Indians started taking to manufacture thereafter, thanks to Alfred Chatterton. In now, you are all in the finance business. Let me get back to that. Till 1906, no Indian could get into organized lending of money or conducting banking services. All Indian men who were interested in finance could only do it informally. So in Tirnilveli and all that, you would have many Brahmin families that were into money lending. They would call themselves banks, but they were not banks in the accepted sense. The biggest bank in India at that time was the Arbuthnot Bank, and that was headquartered in Chennai. And in 1906, the Arbuthnot Bank collapsed, and it took thousands of investors along with it. They all became insolvent, including the governor of Madras. And so the British establishment was very keen that the chairman of the bank should be protected, the director cannot be arrested. So they had an English judge sitting in on the trial. And that time you had this lawyer, V. Krishnaswamy Ayer, who fought for the arrest of the chairman of the bank and for the ensuring that all the investors get a proportionate return on the sale of the, on the liquidation of all the assets of the bank. So the English barrister who was opposing him said that you cannot come because you are not a barrister, you are a vakil. You are of a status lower than what you can to argue this particular case. This man took out his coat and said, I am not arguing this as a vakil. I am arguing this as an investor in that particular bank. I am an interested party. Nobody can prevent me from fighting for my own rights. So the case was fought and justice was given. And then he started Indian Bank. He said that if Indians cannot run a British bank, we will start an Indian bank. So in 1906, they began the Indian Bank. At the same time, Canada Bank began in the Karnataka area, Indian Bank bought the head office of the Arbuthnot Bank and they flew their flag on top of it. Even today, Indian Bank is in the same place in Raja Jisale. The headquarters of the Indian Bank is in the same place. From then on, Indians get into financial advisory, they get into insurance, they get into the stock exchange. The Madras Stock Exchange starts in the 1930s because of this particular bank. After this, Indians began to have confidence that they could run their own businesses. Then we had the harbour. The harbour was constructed between 1875 and 1914. You must remember in the First World War, Chennai was the only city to be bombed. In the Second World War, Chennai was the only city not to be bombed. It's a unique record. And so between the two World Wars, our harbour grew to become one of the best harbours in the country. And all the defence establishments came to be located over here. They had to be financed, and that is why you have a place called Avadi. Incidentally, Avadi is not armors and vehicle development or whatever. That's the name of a village that goes back to 1300, 1400. We have later on explained it like this. And the defense companies all set up there. That harbor was due to this man called Francis Prick. Now, I was mentioning to you TV Sundaramayengar. TV Sundaramayengar starts his business in Madurai because he thinks we cannot be clerks. There is no point in working for a master, let us be our own businessman. Every business he ran failed. Not even one business succeeded. He was called Marakada Ayengar because he had started a timber shop and it collapsed. He began a cycle repair shop that collapsed. Everything that TVS touched did not succeed, but he never ever gave up. Finally, he took to automotive component trading and told all his five sons, you don't have to go to college. College is not going to teach you anything. You finish school and come and sit in the office and you begin managing the business. Now, by the 1960s, all these five sons had, one son was dead, the other four sons had decided that they had to get into manufacturing. They were in trading till the 1960s. In 1961, they said, we have to start getting into manufacturing. They moved to Chennai. And they began Wheels India, Brakes India, Lucas TVS, and uh, one more company. Was, I'm not able to get the name. These four companies began together, and then from then on, the TVS empire grows. But one among those four sons is T.S. Santanam. Santanam is 
if he was born in the United States, we would be celebrating his life in the financial industry, but because he was an Indian, we don't talk about him to the extent that we ought to. Santanam was the man who said that vehicles, heavy vehicles, and particularly lorries, are required in a very big way in India if the Indian economy has to grow, and so we need to finance the heavy vehicles. And you, when you are a transport operator, you will never get money from the banks because they will ask you for your balance sheet, they will ask you for all kinds of things which you will never be able to give. So you have to have a non-banking financial corporation. And that is how Sundaram Finance really begins. And he starts that and he revolutionizes the whole of the transport industry. And even today, Sundaram Finance perhaps is not the largest NBFC, but it is one of the most respected NBFCs in the whole country. NBFCs may come, NBFCs may go, but Sundaram Finance continues and remains that way. It's all because of the vision of T.S. Santanam, who was T.V. Sundaram Iyengar's son. This photograph is the launch of India's first tractor, Massey Ferguson, and you can see Anant Ramakrishnan standing there wearing a bow tie. Now, Anant Ramakrishnan had joined Simpson and Company in the 1930s. And he told the company that by 1940s, when independence comes, you cannot be a British business house running business in India. You've got to Indianize in a very big way. And you have to acquire all the British businesses that people will be selling for a song because they are leaving the country and going away. He saw that opportunity. So he formed a holding company called Amalgamations Limited. See the very name. Amalgamations is basically you amalgamate all the companies that you are getting. And between 1942 and 48, when all the British companies were selling and leaving the country in a hurry, he acquired every one of those companies. Addison, George Oaks, Higginbotham's, uh, T. Staines and Company. He want, they even offered Connemara to him, Spencer's and Connemara. But he said, as a Brahmin, I will not get involved in business where you're selling liquor and cooking meat. And so he refused to do that business. The mail, the newspaper, all these things he acquired. And in 1949, when India, India became independent in 47, and in 49, when the government of India said, we have to get into industrial manufacture, he set up India's first automotive component manufacturing company in Chennai. And that is India Pistons Limited. At that time, even a car was not being manufactured in India. But he set up an automotive component manufacturing company. He said, if a car is not made today, it will surely be made in a few years from now. We will need it at that time. Now, who was going to operate all the heavy castings that India Pistons were producing? Indian labor was not able to do it. They recruited convicts from the Chennai prison. They were the people who came and operated the foundry and got the castings moving. That You think of the you know, pioneering thought. If you are not able to get labor, go to the jail and recruit the convicts and bring them. How many people will have this idea? He was able to do it. MCT, Chidambaram Chetiar, who began Indian Overseas Bank, and today we all talk about Ambani, but remember, this man began polyester manufacturing in Travancore Rayon 40 years before Ambani was even thought of it. It's just that he died in an air crash in Singapore in the 1950s when he was not even 52. If he had lived, Indian history and business history would have been very different. How can we forget these two great men who put us on the industrial path? Kamraj, who was not even educated, but he had the vision to have more educated people surrounding him and to take their advice. And between R. Venkatraman and Kamraj, they begin India's first industrial estate in a place called Gindi. The Gindi industrial estate is India's first industrial estate. All the manufacturing that we talk about today, Ambasur, Ennur, everything is because of the vision of these two people. And Kamraj, what honesty! In today's world, can you even imagine somebody like Kamran? Sometimes when you think of him, it does something to you. Such a great person. I'm coming towards the end of my presentation. I have left out Hollywood. Money, making money through cinema. How many of us know that Chennai, Hollywood, is bigger in financial value than Bollywood? It actually makes more films in a year than what Bombay's film industry does. And S.S. Vasan, who came cycling all the way from Trichy to Madras because there was no money, and his mother was actually selling idlis on the railway station in Trichy. He said, I don't want a college education, I want to make money. 
came to Madras, bought the Ananda Vigadan magazine, found it was not making money, wrote a book, Illara Valkayin Ragasiyangal, The Secrets to a Happy Married Life. People thought it was a sex book and bought it. It was actually full of good advice on how to... So it's like, you know, you sell a chess book saying that 50 positions and everybody buys it. And then you find it's on chess. So he made money on it and then Ananda Vigadan became very successful, then began Gemini Studios and then produced Chandralekha in 1948, dubbed it in Hindi and showed the Hindi film industry as to what a Tamil film could be like and it became the biggest hit in its time. Then came A.V. Mayapan who started May AVM Studios and so on, you know. I have not forgotten the women. Bengaluru Nagaratnama at a time when in the early 1900s when the gramophone industry came. Women and men were afraid to record their voices. They thought that there is a boodham inside the gramophone horn which will take away your life. Nagaratnama was one of the first people to record her voice for the gramophone industry. By 1905 was earning two and a half lakhs a year as a performing artist. And the first woman to pay income tax. T.P. Rajalakshmi down below, the first Indian woman to become a film producer and the first Tamil heroine. And then we have our Sivaboga Mammal over there who went to jail for India's freedom in 1930s and in prison decided when she comes out, she must become a chartered accountant. What is called a GDA in those days, the gov what is it, a government diploma, general diploma in accountancy, which is today's chartered accountancy. TP Raj, the uh, Sivaboga Mammal writes the exam on, on coming out, qualifies, the government does not give her her certificate saying you have been to prison in our code, a professional cannot practice if the professional has been to prison. Sivaboga Mamal challenges that decision in the court, fights it all the way to the Federal Court of India. Finally, they give her the judgment in her favor and she becomes India's first woman chartered accountant. That's MGR with his noon meal scheme. Let's not forget this. When it came out, everybody made fun of it. Think of the number of students who ate in those kitchens and studied and then became educated because of the meal that it was providing. And we must remember MGR for one more thing. He privatized education. At a time when there were only so many educational institutions run by the government, he said there is no harm in private people taking on education. Engineering colleges and medical colleges came to be privatized. So many more people went through the education and today if Chennai is India's third exporter of IT. It has something to do with the fact that there were so many engineering colleges. And if Chennai is India's leader in Medicare, something has to do with those medical colleges that came out thereafter. I'm coming to the last two slides. Medical industry. How many of us know that out of India's $3 billion medical tourism income, Chennai contributes 48% of it. One city contributes 48% of India's medical tourism income. The oldest hospital, the general hospital, has been in existence since 1677. We are in 2020 today. The oldest eye hospital, the second oldest eye hospital in the whole world is the government Kannaspatri, started in 1817 in Egmore. The mental health hospital has been around for 225 years. This is the kind of record that we have. And Apollo was the hospital that started at a time when the government will not fund a hospital project because hospital was meant to be a charitable business. It was PC Reddy who went and met the Prime Minister, two of them, Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi, and convinced them that there is case for starting a private network of hospitals the government rules were amended, RBI amended itself so that banks could be authorized to lend money to a hospital project and that is how Apollo hospitals came into existence. Still today, India's leading private hospital chain and after that, we've had any number of others. Counter to that, Shankar Netralia, to prove that you can be a not-for-profit hospital and still be an outstanding success in this particular city. I've come to the last. Lastly, it's not enough to make money, you must also learn to give the money. Between 1932 and 1997, when she gave her last concert, this lady, and I don't have to tell you who that is, earned two and a half crores. 
every rupee was given to charity. On that, I will conclude my speech. Chennai is Vandare Varavaikum Chennai. It gave, you know, it has given life to people. It is also Dharma Miga Chennai. It's a city that practices charity. Let's celebrate it and let's celebrate all those who live here. Thank you very, very much.